you're not going to argue somebody else into belief. And God has a problem with that. God can't wrap his perfect arms around our imperfection. Our entire lives are based on the truth of this message. All right, well, good morning, Sunlight. Wow, first time. I'm impressed. You guys had some coffee this morning. Uh, my name's Corey. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, it's my privilege today to bring the Word of God uh, to our church family this morning. And a couple uh, quick things, a uh, couple of areas of ministry that I work primarily in is going to be with our youth group, our high school and middle school students. And so this is my invitation to you guys. If you are a high school or middle school student, and would like to come out to youth group. Uh, we do high school on Tuesdays and middle school on Thursdays. We'd love to have you out there. If you are a little bit more chronologically superior uh, to our high school and middle school students and would like to serve in youth ministry, we'd love to have you there too. Uh, there is nothing quite like impacting the, ne the next generation. And so we invite you guys out of that. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I also work with our community groups. Uh, we've been talking a lot about that. Uh, this is my last shameless plug um, today uh, about community groups. Uh, there is a group for you. We would love for you guys to get involved in community groups. Uh, if you want to uh, meet together with some like-minded individuals, learn more about uh, the Bible, learn more about the Christian faith, um, there's a group for you. If you want to play basketball or uh, flag football or pickleball, or uh, if you're a psychopath and want to go running with Pastor Steve on Monday mornings at five in the morning, there's a group for you. Uh, and then if you want to grill and smoke meat, there's literally a group for you. There's a group for everybody. Uh, anyway, that said, uh, the last few weeks we've been going through uh, a sermon series uh, on the topic of apologetics. Uh, apologetics um, it, it really has to do with uh, what we believe and why we believe it. And so as we come to this, uh, we've really come to the central part of our service. Uh, the Bible, uh, this is the thing that we do. Uh, sure, we do fall festivals, and sure, we do youth group, and sure, we do all sorts of different things, but, but this, this is what we hold at the center. Uh, this is what we believe. Uh, with that said, when talking about apologetics, uh, people sometimes get excited. Uh, by the way, if you're not sure, if you haven't been here the last few weeks, apologetics really has to do with defending your faith. And people get really excited because they get to learn how to argue better than the atheists in their lives and finally make them look stupid. Or at least that's what I used to think, right? That's that's what we sometimes do, um, but that's not really the point of apologetics. Uh, you're not going to argue somebody else into belief. You're not going to persuade someone who doesn't believe to start trusting in God. That's not likely. That's God's job. That's what God does. God changes the heart of man, not us. And so what is the point of apologetics? Well, I, I, think, I think this is the point uh, the point of understanding the, the proper responses to some of the biggest doubts in the faith for us, uh, we need to be reminded, right? We need to be reminded. It's likely that, that most people in this room at some point have walked through a series of doubts. And, and so the, the heart of knowing what you believe and why you believe it, it's not just for people out there. It's for us. It's because we would be foolish to not have an answer to what we believe and why we believe it when doubt creeps into our hearts. God? Um, this will be distracting for 25 minutes, but that's okay. We're just going to work with it. We need to have an answer for what we believe and why we believe it when doubt creeps into our own hearts. And doubt will creep in. And so, yes, it's helpful to have an answer when somebody else has questions about your faith and about your worldview, uh, and our answers should be full of both humility and confidence. Humility that it's all about God, not us, but then confidence that it's all about God and not us. 
And, and so the heart of apologetics is this. It's, it's having an answer for what we believe and why we believe it because we need to be reminded. And so this morning, uh, we're going to be looking to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you've got a Bible uh, around you, you can find that in pa- on page 1787. I'll give you guys a moment to get there. And uh, while you're turning there, let's pray together. Well, Heavenly Father, God, we love you. God, we, we gather together because of the truth claim that we're going to be talking about this morning, because we believe that you lived and you died and you rose, and that that changed the course of history. Uh, God, I, I pray that as we approach this text this morning, that we would do so humbly, that we would do so knowing that you're so much bigger than we can perceive, uh, but God, that we would also approach it confidently, that, that what your word says is true, and we can trust you, and we can trust it. Uh, God, for many of us, this very subject may be the source of some of the doubts that we face in our faith journeys. Uh, there might be some of us who are wrestling with doubts right now. God, I I pray that you would open up our hearts and our eyes and our ears to see and hear and experience you in a new way. God, that we would walk away with a fresh understanding uh, of of who you are and what you've done. God, that this wouldn't just be head knowledge, but that this would transform us from the inside out. God, I pray that we don't leave here unchanged, but that we leave here more in love with who you are, more in awe of what you've done, that we would leave here more like you. And we pray this in your name. Amen. All right, so 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let me get a thumbs up if you're there. All right, good. Let me get a thumbs down if the person next to you could use a little deodorant. All right, Adam, I see you. All right, so uh, we're looking at the resurrection of Jesus here. Uh, Potentially one of the things that if anybody in this room has had doubts, uh, this may be something that we've struggled with a little bit. And so we're going to be in the first 11 verses. Uh, Verse 1, it says this, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believe. So, uh, I'm going to make a pretty bold statement here. If the resurrection didn't happen, then Christianity and everything that Jesus taught is pointless. But if it did, if the resurrection did happen, then Christianity and the things that Jesus taught is the only thing that matters. So a lot hinges on this. Uh, A lot hinges on this claim. Uh, Paul talks about the gospel. Uh, The gospel is this message that saves us from sin and its consequences to a life lived for eternity in heaven. And at sunlight, we use three words to describe the gospel. Do you know what those three words are? Sin, salvation, service. Good job, guys. Uh, Quick explanation of each one. Uh, By the way, We don't use these three words because we think it's some kind of secret sauce that saves people. We believe it, uh, we use these three words because uh, we think that they're easy to remember and that if you can remember them in a small explanation of each one, uh, that you will 
be equipped with the gospel to preach to yourself and to the people in your lives. And so the first word is sin, and this is our understanding of sin, that since the fall of man, man is sinful and doesn't measure up to God's perfect standard. And God has a problem with that. God can't wrap his perfect arms around our imperfection, and so there's a punishment for our sin, and that punishment is death. And it doesn't matter how good of a person I try to be, how many little old ladies I help across the street, I actually increase my guilt every day. I can't decrease it. And so this is bad news. But there's good news. And the good news is that God is loving and merciful, and he sent Jesus to be a substitute for our sins. That God took Jesus and took every sin that you and I ever have or will commit and placed them on Jesus at the cross. And, and he died in our place, and he, was rose, uh, he rose three days later, proving that sin and death had been completely overcome, and that now service, you and I have new lives to be lived with and for him forever. This is the gospel. This is the good news that Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 15. And, and so, Christianity, it, it rises or falls on this one historical event, the resurrection of Jesus. If Jesus rose from the dead, then everything that he claimed is true, that he is the Son of God, that he is the Savior, that he is the Messiah, but if he did not rise from the dead, then the things that he said and taught are worthless. And so the sermon's really going to have three parts this morning. Uh, the first part is going to have to do with uh, what are some of the common skepticisms or objections uh, surrounding the resurrection. Uh, the second part is what Christians believe to be true, why we believe that the resurrection happened. And the last part will have to do with implications for the believer's life regarding the resurrection. And so are you guys ready with me? Are we, are we good? Awesome. Uh, here's part one, some common objections to the resurrection. I'm going to give you four. There's a lot more that you could go home and uh, research, but I'm, I'm going to give you four of the big ones. Uh, here's the first one. It's called the swoon theory. The swoon theory claims that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross, but that he only fainted or passed out, right? And so according to this theory, uh, he was, when, he was placed in the uh, when he was placed in the tomb, he was still alive. The disciples, thinking that he had died, buried him. But then a few hours later, uh, Jesus got up and walked right out. Now, if you're like me, uh, you sort of immediately understand this claim to be a little ridiculous. Uh, and, and here's why. I, I think that if you, if you need to understand this claim, you also need to understand what happened when somebody was being crucified. Uh, it was really painful. Their hands typically would be either tied or nailed to the cross. In Jesus' case, it was, t uh, it was nailed. Uh, the cross then would be hoisted up uh, with the person hanging on it. Their feet would be nailed in such a way that uh, the person had to push up to breathe, which would cause pain every time. And this would also prolong the suffering. And the victim would have to, uh, the, the victim usually didn't die from, from pain, they would die from suffocation. Uh, they would have to push themselves up to be able to breathe, but that was so painful that they couldn't keep it, so they just hung there. Uh, hanging with their arms stretched like this would be, it would make it really difficult to breathe, and so the person would push themselves up with the, with the nails in their feet to get air, and eventually the, the victim could no longer lift themselves up to breathe and would die from suffocation, shock, dehydration, or heart failure. Uh, in some cases, to, to quicken the death, the Roman guards would, would break the legs of the person hanging on the cross. And this would prevent them from pushing up to breathe. In Jesus' case, his legs weren't broken because he was already dead by the time the soldiers checked. To confirm his death, a Roman soldier stuck a, a spear in his side and blood and water flowed out. The idea that Jesus had all of this happen to him and then just managed to walk out of a tomb is, is ridiculous. Uh, first, the Roman soldiers were sure they were dead before they even put the spear in them. Second, the idea that Jesus could somehow wake up, push the stone away, overcome the soldiers guarding the tomb, and then convince his disciples that he had miraculously risen again would be pretty hard to believe. And so that's the, 
the swoon theory. Uh, the second is actually my favorite. Uh, it's the hallucination theory. Um, I say favorite ironically because I think it's the most ridiculous. Uh, but those uh, who uh, subscribe to the hallucination theory, they, they would say that uh, those who claim to see Jesus after the crucifixion were hallucinating. That the apostles wanted so badly and expected to see Jesus that they experienced mass hallucinations. Okay, Jesus appeared to several people at different times and in different places. At one point, he appeared to 500 people at one time. You're going to tell me that 500 people experienced the exact same hallucination at the exact same time? Like, it's, it's craziness. Not to mention, I mean, there were people who spoke to him and touched him. Uh, again, this theory is, is, is ridiculous. It falls short. Uh, the third is the impersonation theory. Uh, the idea is this, that uh, the uh, appearances weren't really Jesus at all, but that somebody was impersonating. So, okay, a couple of quick thoughts. One, the disciples at this point were reluctant to believe in the resurrection at all. Uh, they just watched their friend die. They, they felt hopeless. They were scattered. Um, they were locking themselves in rooms. Uh, they were doubtful, and it would have been hard to convince them uh, that it was really him. Uh, I mean, look at Thomas, right? Thomas needed proof that it was really Jesus. It would have been really hard to impersonate him. Uh, I've known Kyle for a long time. Um, I think we're going on, what, 14 years? All right, pretty close. Um, we've hung out a lot. I don't think that somebody could come dressed up as Kyle and impersonate him and fool me. Uh, these guys spent three years with Jesus. Uh, they knew him. They uh, looked at him like they were not going to be deceived by an imposter. And so again, the impersonation theory just falls short. And then the last one is the theft theory that the disciples or somebody else stole the body of Jesus. And, and I think to even talk about this one, you have, to just, you have to think about who would have and who could have. So... The Romans, they could have, but they wouldn't have, right? Uh, Pilate had agreed to have the guards uh, watch and seal the tomb uh, in order to prevent a theft from happening. Uh, they wouldn't have. The Jewish leaders, they couldn't have and wouldn't have, right? They were the ones who had requested a guard to protect the tomb uh, against theft, and so they wouldn't have. Uh, by the way, if any of Jesus' enemies had taken the body, as soon as there were claims about a resurrection, what would have stopped them from parading the corpse around to, to disprove that, right? And, and so the fact that they didn't do that suggests at least that they didn't have the body. The women that first discovered the empty tomb, they couldn't have and probably wouldn't have. Uh, they were going to uh, anoint Jesus' body. Uh, they couldn't have overpowered Roman guards. They couldn't have moved the stone away. Uh, the disciples couldn't have and wouldn't have. They were scared. They were scattered. They were huddling together in locked rooms. Uh, some had even left town. Uh, these were timid, anxious, disorganized guys. And so stealing the body of Jesus from under the nose of a guard, I mean, how, how could they have done that? And so, again, the theft theory, it, it falls short. And so, okay, these are four of the big claims as to uh, why the resurrection could be false. Um, here's what we believe. Christians believe that Jesus actually died. That Jesus didn't just pass out. That he didn't just lose consciousness. We believe that the crucifixion ended Jesus' physical life. That Roman soldiers crucified Jesus. They finished the execution. Right? Uh, they didn't break his legs because he was already dead. And, and as a final precaution, they stuck the spear in his side, ensuring death. Not to mention, those who would have handled his body, removing it from the cross and taking it to the tomb, would have been convinced that he was dead. Uh, we also believe that the gravesite was secure, that Jewish leaders met with Pilate and urged him to secure the gravesite. Uh, 
They said that Jesus predicted that he would die again in three days, and so to assure that the disciples or somebody else couldn't conspire in a resurrection hoax, Pilate ordered the official seal of Rome to be attached to the tomb to prevent any grave robbers from tampering with the tomb, right? Roman soldiers stood guard. A huge stone was, was rolled in front of the tomb. Uh, we also believe, man, women were the first to receive the news that Jesus had risen. At this point in human history, if you wanted to start a movement, you wouldn't have started with women. <laughs> this pushed against societal norms. In, in Jewish society, uh, a woman's eyewitness testimony was not considered to be reliable, or at least was considered to be less reliable. And so you wouldn't have started a movement like this with women. A lot of people claim to see Jesus. A lot of people claim to see the resurrected Jesus. Uh, Paul wrote uh, himself right here in 1 Corinthians 15, the, the, the text that we started with. Uh, he said that at one point more than 500 people had seen him. And that you can go fact check it. They're still alive, most of them. Go ask them. This would be a really easy thing to disprove. Uh, by making this kind of a statement, he gave critics the chance to go and check the claims for himself. Uh, eyewitness testimony would have been considered very strong. Uh, Pastor Zach mentioned that a few weeks ago. Another thing, look at the changed lives of the apostles. Jesus' disciples were in a state of panic after the crucifixion. Uh, Peter, at one point, said that he was ready to die for Jesus and lost heart and denied even knowing him. But after the, after the resurrection, there was a dramatic change in their lives. Soon they were courageous. They were standing face to face with the one who had crucified their leader. They became unstoppable in determination to obey the risen Jesus, and even threats of imprisonment, torture, and death didn't stop them. Uh, if you look at the lives of some of the apostles, uh, Peter was crucified upside down. Andrew was crucified, and it took two days. Uh, James was beheaded. Philip was crucified. Nathaniel was skinned alive. Thomas was speared. Matthew was stabbed. You know, who, you know what, what I wouldn't die for? A lie. No one dies for a lie. But someone might be willing to die for the truth. And, and I'm convinced, at least, these guys never would have willingly gone to their deaths for what they knew to be a lie. And then my last one. The very existence of the church argues for the reality of the resurrection. The church is, is God's gift to us. If the resurrection never happened, then what explains the transformation that a small group of guys, these terrified disciples and, and, and men and women who were willing to suffer and die because of their refusal to renounce Jesus' resurrection? What changed them into bold, confident, courageous witnesses that were willing to carry the gospel to every corner of the world? Only the resurrection explains that. And so, okay, we've talked a bit about uh, some objections to the resurrection. Uh, we've talked about why Christians believe the resurrection actually happened. But, but what about us? What about believers? Uh, what are the implications of the resurrection? Well, if the tomb is empty, Jesus is proven to be the Son of God. Uh, Romans, uh, Paul writes this, that uh, uh, in verse, uh, starting in verse 2, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures regarding his Son, who was as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and through, uh, who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. If the tomb is empty, Jesus overpowered sin and death. Uh, Acts 2.24 says, But God raised him from the dead, 
freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. If the tomb is empty, our sin debt has been canceled. Uh, Colossians 2 says that when you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. If the tomb is empty, God's power is alive in you. Uh, Ephesians 1 I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion in every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. If the tomb is empty... We are enabled to turn away from our wicked ways. Uh, Acts 3, when God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. If the tomb is empty, we are justified. Romans chapter 4, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. If the tomb is empty, we are not condemned. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. If the tomb is empty, we are more than conquerors. Who shall separate us uh, from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long, we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. If the tomb is empty, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Romans 8, 38 and 39, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If the tomb is empty, our pain holds purpose. Romans 8, 28, uh, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. If the tomb is empty, we can be fearless. Uh, Revelation chapter 1, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. If the tomb is empty, the Holy Spirit's been given to us. When the day of Pentecost came, this is Acts chapter 2, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. If the tomb is empty, we have new life lived with and for Christ. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we might no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now we know if Christ, uh, now we know now, we, now, if we died with Christ, we believe that he will also live with him. Uh, we will also live with him, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. If the tomb is empty, we can approach the throne of grace with confidence. Hebrews chapter 4, therefore, since we have a great high priest who ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, will hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. 
Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence that, uh, so that we may have uh, received mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. If the tomb is empty, death has been defeated. Later on in our 1 Corinthians passage, uh, in verse 54, he writes, When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And last one. If the tomb is empty... It means that he is making all things new. That he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. Revelation 21, 4 and 5. church family, believers, Christians, because of the resurrection, we have been given full life. Because the resurrection is true, we can walk forward in life with confidence and humility. Our entire lives are based on the truth of this matter. We will never know on this side of heaven, the extent of his goodness, of his kindness, and of his grace that Jesus poured out onto you and to me. However, we get glimpses through the scriptures of God's heart towards us. Jesus not only removed sin, but through the spirit he gave us life, and we will sit in the presence of the Father forever. Let's pray.